Hey guys, welcome back to The Reading Stack. I'm Hunter. Um, it's so good to be with you today. I thank you for watching. I just wanted to, before I begin the book review today, go through a few things. Uh, just to tell you, um, I've started a podcast, uh, The Reading Stack. You can currently see it on Spotify, and you can go to uh, the link tree on our channel uh, in the About section to go directly to that. Uh, I should be able to put content out on the podcast more regularly than I am with video just due to the editing process but uh, I haven't forgot about you on uh, YouTube and I still want to do stuff there because I know uh, from the feedback you've given me uh, that some of the videos have been impactful uh, good or you know meaningful in some way to you so I'm still going to continue producing YouTube videos but uh, also I, I do I know and recognize that I could probably do a podcast a little more regularly review uh, books a little quicker. Uh, the reason for my absence for a little bit, about a month or more, was uh, I was getting my computer fixed, so it's all repaired back, new and improved, so uh, I'm so excited to continue putting out content for y'all, and uh, I thank you so much for all the support, the likes, comments, the subscriptions, and uh, the important feedback just to make uh, things better and all they can be, so thank you so much. For your support it's great to be back with you today what i want to do is a uh, kind of a special review because i've always done just one book for a review but today i'm actually doing two books by the same author that are very uh, closely related and interconnected so i'm pretty stoked to share these with you uh, books i read real recently the books i have are uh, right here it is Man of the House and The Household and The War for the Cosmos, by both by C.R. Wiley. And uh, Man of the House was published in 2017, and The Household and The War for the Cosmos was published in 2019, uh, both by uh, C.R. Wiley. Man of the House is uh, earlier, as I said, and uh, it's 135 pages. Great book. I can't wait to share this uh, in depth with you. The Household and the War for the Cosmos is 120 pages, so a little bit shorter. Both are excellent. Um, so C.R. Wiley, the author of these books, he is a uh, pastor. He's an author. He's a real estate developer, I believe, and has a lot of experience in construction. And how I found him was through his, his and two other gentlemen's podcast called uh, The Theology Pugcast. So it's a really awesome podcast where they discuss a lot of matters relating to like worldview, Christian worldview, history, um, really just kind of the, just matters that are on their heart to discuss. And boy, is that a, a podcast where I'm just taking notes. I hear so much on there um, that I've never heard before. So I'm going to leave a link in the description to their uh, podcast. Uh, for you to check that out and see if you enjoy it. but uh, and, and as I tell you about this book, there's a lot more on there they discuss that's just very enriching and uh, insightful. So, The Household and the War for the Cosmos. This is what I read first, but it's the later book. And it's very interesting. As you can see here, it is essentially a book that aims to recover the Christian vision for the family. What what is the Christians' unique view for how they see the household, the family? Well, the book's divided up into two parts. The first book, I believe, is Pietas, which is uh, the word we get piety from, and really what that means. It's not a, it's an old-fashioned word we don't use much anymore. The second half of the book is the household and the war for the cosmos, the proper. Uh, title for the book. To explain this, just kind of what the book is like, it starts off and it's really good in how it um, tries to examine pietists, where we get piety from. It To do this, he goes back to the story of the Aeneid, um, the Roman story of Aeneas, and I believe it was, I haven't read the Aeneid, I, I really need to read it, but essentially, uh, you know, he's like this Roman patriarch that Roman society looks to that story of him and his family for the meaning and the instruction on how they were to live and what they were to aspire to. 
So that's the Roman story that uh, C.R. Wiley uses to examine piety. But he doesn't stop there. He goes to the Abrahamic story in Genesis of Abraham and how essentially he is you know, called the patriarch, one of the patriarchs, and he is that figure that Jews and Christians look to, to, or should I say on the Christian part, but definitely the Jewish part, they look to him as that patriarch that really informs what is a godly uh, father, even though he messes up a lot, you know, and, and that's what's amazing about the biblical figures is they're portrayed very realistically. They are like us, flawed and, uh, you know, not perfect. Uh, but, but he contrasts these two because uh, they both went on a journey that uh, their ancestors would forever remember them for, and so they and they also had a very higher. Um, you say piety is really kind of tied to this devotion and duty that one has to fulfill, and so they were patriarchs. And today, he really examines this in the modern term. A very unpopular word you hear is the patriarchy. You know, it's like ah, it, it's a those are protest words. You know, um, patriarchy. But he really goes to explain it that the way we understand it now has kind of been, um, I don't know, maybe mutated or evolved to where we see it. And he, he defines it like this. We see it today kind of like the male figures arbitrary, so like whimsical, you know, just what he decides to do with like a selfish will or intent. So what he's doing for himself, you know, he throws his weight around to get what he wants and it doesn't really have this bigger vision or any kind of selflessness or like that duty and devotion that uh, the original sense would uh, convey historically it was the male was the like duty bound maybe we'd say servant leader that uh, that the household depended on uh, for certain things that he really examines. And uh, and he goes in and talks about, you know, the family's sort of the economic vision of the family and how it was seen as that this household structure existed before there was any kind of like social services, before there was all these things we rely and depend on today. So if you took away all those things that we have uh, created and invested in, if those things were to collapse, you know, or whatever i mean what do we depend on then you know so it was very interesting uh thinking about that just examining how people lived and made it in times past because that really you know you go to some places in the world and you're like wow you really wonder how people survived and pioneered and you know just made it uh but it was through the structure that they had to you know rely on and adhere to and it was rough <laughs> Essentially, so the second part of the book really goes in with the household and the war for the cosmos. Really examines the book of Ephesians in uh, the New Testament, what the Apostle Paul delivered to the church in Ephesus. Essentially, he goes on a very big vision of everything, the cosmological vision that's uh, like everything in creation. We'll say everything, maybe beyond that, just the order out there. Um, so much of what Paul talks about in, I believe it was Ephesians 5, right before Ephesians 6, is the family, you know? And it's like, why does he address the family after he's addressing, he's talking about angels, he's talking about things in the demonic realm, he's talk, talking about things in the heavenly realm, uh, things all through creation that, um, you know, why does he tell, like, husbands, love your wives, wives, respect your husbands, children, obey your parents, Fathers don't exasperate your children. You know, you know, why does he do that? And so the book, the second half of the book, really explains that and just how today we feel like in Ephesians that that was just slapped in there, you know, not for very, uh, you know, calculated purpose. But he, but he really just dr uh, draws that out, that God was like, this is important. like, And, and so just hearing him say that... Uh, explaining that that uh, for the cosmological vision of the way the world and beyond is supposed to go is like right here in this uh, you know microcosm of the family it's the way 
it's like the way God describes salvation in, in one sense is us being adopted into a family where God the Father is, where Jesus is the heir, and we become essentially, in a sense, like brothers with him, co-heirs that we receive God's inheritance through our adoption into that family. And to people that don't understand that familial, family-related vision, we're like, what? <laughs> you know, we don't really get it as much to the way that that original audience would. So to fully understand salvation better and to fully understand creation, the cosmological uh, order, you'd say, to understand that it's just so important to really to really think about these issues of, uh, of authority and how God has uh, bested those down, you know, in like Adam in the garden, you know, when he essentially is first put in this position of authority to... Take, but it has responsibility, right, to take care of the garden, to uh, be fruitful and multiply. Like he's given these tasks, and Eve, if I remember correctly, she isn't given that. But you see, Adam, he kind of just totally abdicates that role. You know, first failure of the patriarchy, and uh, he didn't use his authority essentially that God vested in him, and so. So it goes like, you know, God has the highest authority, the name of above all names, Jesus. Um, and then, you know, angels are termed, you know, and fallen angels like powers, principalities. These are very much authority or as I remember Augustine translated like princedoms in a sense, like these are, you know, authority like rulerships. And so authority is just in everything. You know, we even say like, or hierarchy, you could say. There's even the, uh, you know, king of the jungle, the lion, you know, and uh, maybe the king of the ocean. Uh, I don't know if that's the kraken or what, but um, <laughs> but um, authority and the patriarchy is such an important thing to understanding scripture, the the Christian's place in the universe and in the world. You'd say on page seventy, I want to read this quote just to. Uh, because I thought it was very good um, at, at explaining these kind of things uh, about just what a household is. He's, he begins, To begin, imagine a world without business corporations or social welfare agencies or factories or daycare centers. Where do you suppose people made a living or found help when they needed it? In their households, naturally. Now let that sink in for a moment. Okay, what can we conclude? What can we conclude from this? First of all, a household wasn't a building. It wasn't even a family, although it certainly included one. Essentially, a household was an authority structure. The reason that authority was essential was because a household was an economy. The etymology of that word tells a story. It is derived from two Greek words, oikos, meaning house, and nomos, meaning law. An economy was the law of the house. It directed the labors of its members toward their common good. It's what kept people working together. Household economies were based on some productive enterprise, usually farming or a trade. Sometimes they were subsistence economies where people eked out a living. Other times they produced goods for the market. Either way, in the pre-modern world, households were nearly the only thing going. They produced food, clothing, and nearly everything else worth having. And on top of that, they were social welfare agencies, educating the young and caring for the elderly. People depended on them for almost everything. Today, we largely think of our homes as recreation centers. That's because in the Industrial Revolution, most of the productive economy moved out of the house. Because of this, some people have wondered just what is a father for? But in the first century, a father's authority was unquestioned. People just depended on him for so much that life without him was hard to imagine. He adjudicated household disputes. In a world where the police were never a phone call away, he defended and enforced its boundaries. And he spoke for the household's interest in public forums. A father was so important, his untimely death often led to the breaking up of a household and the distribution of its members. To his relation. So I thought that was pretty important just to lay out 
what the household was in a sense, especially in that early or pre-modern understanding. And so very good stuff there. And I highly recommend this book. If you have any interest in these things or if it sounds totally foreign for you, it might just be a good, uh, good um, level up in the brain. So, okay, so now this is the second one I read, but it actually came earlier. It is Man of the House by the same author. And it's primarily, he lists it as a handbook, a handbook for building a shelter that will last in a world that is falling apart. So pretty good. And uh, the book, you know, he, he goes in first just talking about, you know, like the apocalyptic kind of vision that we so crave in our entertainment. But, but he really goes and draws out just how we say the system that takes care of us the support system, you could say, like in the social welfare and police and, you know, unemployment office, all these kinds of things that we say, oh, it's too big to fail, you know. It's such a big enterprise, bureaucracy, and system, it won't fail. But, you know, that's kind of a naivete. Um, and we should always be prepared for the worst and as well as the most likely events. And uh, so the book is great, and the book is uh, divided into four parts, and the parts uh, kind of lay out like this, the way I have it is, uh, the first part's the framework of the house, just what is it, you know, and it talks a lot about it's made by a covenant, you know, husband and wife, vows, um, and, and I will say, like, this book was a lot less maybe scripture heavy. This book was a lot more very extremely practical. There was some uh, allusions to scripture, but so and so much of this had like Aristotle philosophy and just practical examples from the past. You know, the Puritans, the Pilgrims living, uh, just different people. You know how they made it. Uh, a lot less of the uh, scriptural and Christian vision that the other book had, but the framework is basically those those essential things of what the, the house looked like. And uh, on page 22, it says this. He says this, people do not, he's talking about the market and uh, economy. And he says this, people do not come from money. Money comes from people. When two become one, it leads to all sorts of things. Children, of course, but also Sunday dinners and bedtime stories. Why it even leads to automobiles, rocket ships, fields of grain, and soda pop. This is why the household is the first institution and the most important. From it, every other institution proceeds and what is commonly called the economy grows. So there he's talking about, he, he uses this um, idea that people understood that the health of the whole derived from the health of the parts. You know, and Scripture uses this to talk about the church, the members of the body, and being healthy and being used, uh, mutual appreciation and those things to, gr to grow and to be healthy. Well, just in anything, the sum total is made up of the parts. So the health of the individual will affect the health of the household. The health of the household affects the, ho uh, the health of the city. The health of the city to the state, to the nation, however big you ex expand upon it, the health always comes back to the that lowest, you know, possible unit. So um, there he's saying, you know, when two people decide to get married, to be joined uh, in a covenant, that um, so much comes out of that more than we even think. We think just simple, like, along this line of thinking, but literally he's saying everything comes out of that, you know. Uh, soda pop um, and uh, I thought that was a very beautiful vision and uh, definitely unconventional one I didn't think of and uh, so four parts forgot to really uh, hash that out there's four parts of the book the first is the framework which uh, is kind of what I just alluded to is husband and wife and children you know that's the essential and then children and everything else comes from that the second part is economics, the third part is polity, and the fourth part is the outside. So in the second part, it talks about economics, and a lot of that's going to be related to work. It deals with a lot of property, 
you know, being thrifty, being uh, deals with your job, your the work you're doing, um, and doing that wisely and well, like where it really, you know, like not being workaholic, but also like recognizing good good money opportunities and ways of value, uh, because traditionally the household was seen like the person gets this value and then they pass it on to their children teach them, train them up in, in their sort of thing. Uh, and it talks about just the value, you know, the universal value of property is, uh, it's never bad to own property. He has this quote on page 44 I really liked, and it's talking about uh, generalization versus specialization in, he, in humans. Uh, he uses this quote from Robert Heinlein, science fiction writer. He says, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, Butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, manure, sorry, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly specialization is for insects you know and so think about it like this he's talking about back in the old days like if you're a pioneer or something and you have to depend on yourself it's not like we have such specialization now where it's like call the expert you know we depend on them we lose some of our independence in doing that but there, there's virtues you know trade-offs you could say but um truly like a great feeling of the human experience is to grow and to learn and used to like my great grandpa who's really kind of been a, a patriarchal in a great sense figure for my family this dude was like legit an expert like you know from his military stuff tie knots you know he could work a map he had been all over the place he had been a miner he'd been an entrepreneur he had such a wealth of wisdom, you know, build just anything and it was built to last, you know, just those impressive feats and just everybody in my family has been like, well, what a man, you know, like he, he could really do and teach you just about anything. I really enjoy that and it reminds me of uh, stuff I've read about business that um, when it talks about uh, the CEO personality is that it is different from the specialist, you could say, like the CEO typically has worked the most broad amount of positions, you know, like he's been the janitor at one point, he's been, you know, low level, mid level, senior, to where he has a very unique perspective on how the whole operates and how best to do things, whereas the, you know, the specialist, you know, the PhD, they might be the assistant that knows everything in the world about a few things, you know, and very valuable, but truly like that CEO captain type personality is the one that's been everywhere and has that wisdom and know how, how to do even the, the smallest task to the largest very well. And he knows who he needs to uh, recruit to help him do his job. So I've, I thought that was very interesting, that generalization and just talking about how the, you know, the father, you know, would have to be able to do that, do auto, you know, do mechanical skills, get stuff, repair stuff, get it working. And then, uh, organizational skills, get people to work to get, get organized, um, people skills. He'd have to deal with his neighbor, the state, um, people in his family, uh, and so many things like needing a real breadth of knowledge and experience, expertise. So I, I really like that. And he's got a lot in the book that's really good in that in that tone. Um, when it talks about polity for the third part, it's talking about order, and it's talking about how in a household you need like fairness and justice, and you know, and you need like. The correct amount of like for the justice you know the correct amount of force you know and it's really good on that because uh, he was saying whereas used to you know somebody would spank their kids or you know whatever or there's very different you know discipline measures to 
to train a child right, to get them to learn a lesson, uh, that people don't do that at all now, hardly, but people in taking away that, a lot of times they use real weird psychological tactics that I think that could, you know, in some ways have a very bad effect on a child, you know, if you can't deal with them directly, that you're uh, doing things that psychologically might, you know, undermine them. It, it very interesting, but polity and order and, uh, you know, basically the law of the house, you know, to keep things afloat and working right, you know, where it's not just chaos, right? And, uh, and very, very good advice and counsel there on that. And, and, and also using authority, you know, using the authority you have. The example in both of these books that you use a lot is today, like the father is like the second mom or a good buddy to their kids. And he isn't the one that's training them, that's, you know, enforcing them for their good, but is kind of just wanting to be their friend, wanting them to be happy and uh, letting them do their thing. So it talks a lot about that as, as a counter perspective about how to be the, you know, the leader. And again, not using that arbitrary selfish will that damages people or exasperates them, as scripture says, not to, not to do but use an authority in a great way, in a respectful way, um, and gravitas, you know, using your, your weight and properly. Now then, the last part is the outside, and it talks about, you know, you can't just have it be self-contained and it be all great. The household also exists to uh, deal with the outside world properly. You know, that's dealing with neighbors, that's having being good neighbors, <laughs> good neighborliness, and uh, as well as being a good citizen. You know, if something's going on in the community, you know, it's like showing up to the right meeting, speaking on behalf of your family, you know, and being the leader in that to be for their good, to speak on their behalf, you know. And uh, used to, you know, some of that speaking would be totally only men could, you know, property owners, things like that. Um, and these days, men and women but probably both can in most things equally. Um, but, you know, your kids probably can't, you know, for a lot of things. So it still applies very much the father to get up there to represent, you know, and also to communicate clearly following the law, but also, um, you know, representing his family if there's like an unconstitutional law, anything like that. And then also it talks about friendship. In that chapter or in that part of the book and he uses uh, Aristotle's view of friendship to help us to understand you know, friends in a, in a different way and he uses Aristotle's way of thinking of friends as useful friends pleasant friends and true friends and the useful friends are like uh, the ones that's like hey uh, you know probably like a good neighbor or something you know let's get together and do this um, you know, here I've got this, you've got that, you know, to trade, to help. I, I know I had a neighbor, uh, he would give me uh, farming, let me use farming equipment, you know, and uh, it was very great just, you know, the usefulness of that, and and we hung out and stuff like that, but uh, it was very helpful, um, and to be respectful of the equipment he let me use, uh, th that's helpful. Um, then there's uh, pleasant friends, pleasant friends, uh, or people we enjoy doing, you, you have a fishing buddy or drinking buddy or something like that. Uh, you know, you have a, you know, Sunday. I remember when I was uh, living elsewhere, um, on Sundays there were some buddies that would watch rugby. And uh, so we'd get together and have a great time watching rugby, you know. And that was a foreign sport to me, but I really enjoyed uh, It was a very pleasant time of seeing people uh, collide and uh, win or lose. And... Uh, then true friends are like friends that are probably united more in a way we'd say conceptually. It's not centered around one thing, but it might be around goodness. Or, um, you know, if, if you're somebody that values courage or you value something, then you uh, you and this friend, that's kind of your tie together is an ideal or something like that where it's more enduring, you'd say, and it's... Uh, just the deepest and the richest of friendships. 
and I thought that was very important. And saying you need all three friends, no friend is like less important, but uh, you need the useful, the pleasant, and the true uh, people by your side. And uh, then it kind of ends with the legacy thought, which is, you know, the end in mind is that we're not finite, and there's a point where we die, we give up the ghost, uh, and we have to think about how we handle that as a family, like uh, your legacy, you passing on your like property, your inheritance, your those things for people, as well as passing on like virtue. And that's something probably you have to think about way before you think about just passing on your uh, goods, you know, and things like that. Really beginning with the end in mind, the helpful thought, you know, is structuring your life, your family, your relationships for when ultimately you're gone, you know, not to leave things unfinished, unsettled. And, you know, that was so important you see in the Old Testament where, you know, it's the patriarchs are like, I'm going the way of our fathers, I'm going to die, you know. So they would give the blessing and give the, uh, give the final, you know, kind of words and thoughts. And so, very important, uh, but we don't think about that a lot. We don't think about death or misfortune and things like that, but uh, beginning with the end in mind. Well, so, yeah, that's Man of the House, and uh, earlier, you know, we had The Household and the War for the Cosmos. These, these two books are great, and if you have any interest in, I guess, old-fashioned households or maybe in like the Christian vision, what could be a true vision for the way a house is supposed to uh, work together and uh, thrive as, uh, I think that's a great book. And then th this is just so important, you know, so, so much that's in this book is stuff that doesn't get passed on, like a legacy, uh, the wisdom and the advice, nourishment, and, and wise counsel, uh, that, that they're just such valuable books. I'm so thankful to have read them. Uh, reasons why you wouldn't want that book on your library, these books, is, uh, I mean, The Household and the War for the Cosmos is definitely a Christian vision. It definitely takes you some other places like the Aeneid, but it doesn't stray from that, that it's building to help the reader understand that. So if you didn't want the Christian part, I would say, um, but you still had an interest in these things, I'd say Man of the House would probably be uh, excellent. Now, if you did want to know the Christian vision, uh, Man of the House has a lot of that, but you're definitely going to want The Household and the War for the Cosmos. Other than that, I mean, both the books are very short. I believe both are under 150 pages. Uh, so you could knock them out very quickly and, uh, and judge the value thereof. Guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you will check out these two books, Man of the House and The Household and the War for the Cosmos. Um, great reads. And, uh, We'll have more uh, videos for y'all soon, more podcasts if y'all check that out. I've got a The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, reviewed that um, last week up on the Spotify uh, as we speak. So uh, I hope you will check out that if you're interested in that book maybe. And uh, we'll have more content out for y'all soon. Y'all have a blessed day. Bye.